Welcome back to the Today Tally Podcast. Today, we are joined by author, advocate, and speaker, D. Paul Fleming. Now, D. Paul Fleming you, goes by Doug, but his author name is D. Paul Fleming, and that's important to know, especially when you're looking at getting one of his books. But We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But he is a uh, retired, 100% disabled Navy veteran. Now, he has worked in various roles within both the federal and private sectors, including civil and general construction. He spent 10 years as one of eight nationally elected board members for the Vet Force, the largest and most successful organization for veteran entrepreneurs, representing over 300 veteran service groups. Public Law 109461, known as the Vets First Act, has been a key factor in the success of Vet Force. Now, along with being a published author, Fleming also works as a consultant for various veterans groups and advocates. He is dedicated to helping others overcome trauma, PTSD, and child abuse through his growing podcast platform and is a strong advocate for mental health wellness. With almost four decades of marriage under his belt, he and his wife have raised six children and are now enjoying nine grandchildren. That just speaks to this man's character. This guy's got a lot going on. He's got a good family. He's got nine grandkids, and he still dedicates his time for the betterment of the veteran community. And with that, we are joined by D. Paul Fleming. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. The pleasure is all mine. The mission today is to have a a good solid conversation and add some value to the lives of everyday people out there, especially veterans, but really anybody who's going through traumatic type situations in their life. I hear you. So uh, Doug, you know, I'm going to call you Doug and, and folks, you got to understand. Okay. So his name is D Paul Fleming. Okay. So we're going to get down this a little bit. That's his book author name, but he goes by Doug. His friends call him Doug. So I'm going to call him Doug. All right. So, Doug, you are retired U.S. Navy. What did what did you do in the military? Submarines. If you ever saw the movie Hunt for Red October, Ooh. I spent three years, two months riding that boat. Two years, one month deployed. Man, <laughs> what's submarine life like? Yeah, well, you know what they say: one percent of the country serves in the military, right? Well, one percent of that one percent, I think it's a half a percent of the one percent, right? goes into the uh, submarine corps. It's a, uh, it's an adventure all by itself. You know, there's, there's some unique challenges and some unique perspectives that go on in the, uh, in the submarine world. You know, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the few places where, you know, uh, uh, an E1, E2, all the way up to E5, you know, don't really, don't really matter how many stripes you got. Okay. Until you make E7 and you're, Hanging out in the goat locker, right? Everybody in a submarine is one community. Even the officers, you know, it's a it's a different it's a different environment, uh, and I mean a different environment. You know, 120 guys that um, can figure out how to not only get along but um, uh, bounce off of each other in extremely tight quarters for months and months and months on end. It's an adventure. That's all you got, man, when you're down that deep, buddy. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're, we are one solid unit right now. And we are, yeah, we are at the depths of the, yeah. Ooh, man, I, I, you know, I'm a claustrophobic guy by trade. Yeah, <laughs> throw me in a submarine. That might not be the best job for me. What's it like? Kind of a city within a city and on a submarine? Yeah. Uh, an extremely small city right mm -hmm. you know so um it's it's uh, uh it, it it part of being a submarine sailor is qualifying and uh and earning your dolphins and earn your dolphins you have to know all the systems from uh, keel to stern front to back um you know everything how the nuclear plant works how the torpedoes work and for me um 
driving the boat, helmsman, sternsman, um, blow decks, watch, lookout. I mean, there's a there is a lot of qualifications that go on uh, inside inside the bubble, as we call it, and uh, you know, it's kind of where Bubblehead came from. Um, submarine life's a tough life. It's a lot lot goes on in it, and very few people can hack it. You know, incredible. Yeah, that would. Oh, that would be a tremendous experience for sure. And, you know, something that you can always talk about. I mean, you're not going to ever not go anywhere and not have something to talk about. <laughs> you know, there are going to be a lot of questions raised about, man, like, what's it like, you know, living in a submarine? So when you go out and deploy on submarines, how long are those deployments? Yeah, until you either sink or run out of food. <laughs> no, it's only, those are the only limitations. You sink know, or swim, right? <laughs> right. You know, so you you stay deployed for however however much food rations you packed inside that boat is how long you can remain. And we've been, you know, we were deployed where, you know, we were doing port and starboard six on six off for months and months on end, where um, you know peanut butter and jelly sandwich was your um, was the the staple of what you had to eat because we were, you know, we were in places where. Uh, you didn't want to um, didn't want to make any noise, so cooking wasn't uh, wasn't high on the list. Either with showers or laundry, or you know, there's two different um, water making machines on that boat. One's a 10k, one's a 1.6k. 1.6k, not a lot of water for a, a nuclear powered submarine and 120 men, right? So, so, so how long would you guys stay under at one given time? So my first. My first deployment, I left Groton on a Mac flight, um, went to Italy, was in Africa for a while, um, and then ended up in Diego Garcia, which is quite literally halfway around the world, a dot in the uh, Indian Ocean. And um, got there, and a um, few hours after putting my feet on the top of that boat, I was ordered to meet with the captain on a, on a uh, tennis court, if you can believe it, right? What was I E two E three then? And I'm going to meet with a you know O six the captain, captain of the boat. Talk about being terrified. I get out to the tennis courts. You know I'm shaking, sweating, wondering what in the hell's captain of the boat want to talk to me for? Right? He just looked at me and said, "Listen, I hear you're a a, a pretty hot ticket. You've done a lot of calls on your uh, on your shore time. You know you got a lot of accommodations. You've been given." two stripes meritoriously. Um, I asked for you to come to this command because we're the hottest boat in the Navy and we need, we need sailors like you, but until you qualify, you're a liability. So I need you to get your ass on that boat. You're going to be doing crank duty for 12 to 15 hours a day. And after that's done, you're going to qualify submarines. The faster you qualify submarines, the faster you become a part of this crew. And that was my introduction to the, to the submarine fleet. So, um, yeah, I spent, uh, 76 straight days from the time that boat broke tender and uh we we popped under and you asked you mentioned about being claustrophobic yeah i was claustrophobic myself until they shut that hatch and then that that kind of went away right you know or got stuffed in my sea bag as i as i like to say but 76 straight days that was the that was my first run where we we you know dove and then resurfaced but by the time we came back i i qualified submarines in 89 days and if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe it's the fastest E4, E5 and below, fastest qualifying submariner in the history of submarine corps. Hmm. By the way, I qualified submarines, which you have a year to qualify. I qualified in 89 days, but I also qualified Helms Plane, um, Lookout, Blow Decks. I qualified a bunch of watch stations at the same time while I was doing mess duty, washing dishes and serving food for um, – 12, 14 hours, 15 hours a day. It's quite an adventure. Wow. So what's it like to be underwater in a submarine for 76 days and then to resurface and actually see the sun at sea level? Yeah. So imagine locking yourself in your closet, you know, or your bedroom, maybe. Shutting off all comms, blocking out the windows so you can't see. Um, And then go on watch for six hours off for 12 um, under normal conditions. And then once you're hot, whether you're chasing a Victor three, 
you know, recently a Victor was, or it looked to me like a Victor class submarine, Russian sub was um, cruising up and down the Eastern seaboard. That, that's mm -hmm. normal. We used to pick them up in the North Atlantic and follow them along the, along the uh, East coast. And then they'd run down to Cuba and hang out there for a little while. We'd go into Gitmo or, or drop, you know, uh, drop it off to another boat down by uh, lower East coast. Um, what was it like? Okay, the best I can tell people is lock yourself in a room, black out all the mirrors, all the wind or not the mirrors, but the windows, all right, and just uh, go on, stand to watch for six hours, and and uh, you know, then find something to do for six hours, because when you're hot, you're only in your rack if you're not on watch. When you're not hot, we're policing the boat and field day and and um, qualifying and doing drills and you know, it's uh. It's it's a pretty wild adventure, so you don't you don't really notice the 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 the, the days are long, but there's nothing to mark them by. So, you know, a few months go by, uh, you're pretty eager to get off the uh, get outside. But um, in hindsight, it's there's nothing really to gauge it. So it's long hours, long days, and months kind of all bleed into one. Fascinating, you know, sir. You spent. Um... I mean, what did you spend? What twenty years in the Navy? No, I did six, and oh, I got six. hurt. I got hurt in my first four-year run, and I got hurt bad enough where the Navy was working on an eval for me, and I wasn't getting an answer when it came time to re-enlist. So um, uh, the short version is, I I decided to get out, and they um, my I had a meeting with the VA, an appointment with the VA. Mm -hmm. at discharge that took six months and then that process eventually retired me from the from injuries mm. and then you definitely wouldn't just leave your service uh if you will you would continue to serve this country in a different way as an advocate um and that's what led you to um you know writing a book and you know becoming, you know, a speaker and somebody that is going to, uh, you know, give the voiceless a voice, if you will. Can you describe a little bit about what you do right now within the veteran community to help veterans that are, uh, you know, going through traumatic type situations? Yeah. So I'm focused on two points. One is helping veterans tell their story. And the other is um, getting eyes on the 50 plus veterans a day that are committing suicide. Parallel to that, um, every veteran that commits suicide leaves somewhere between 50 and 100 plus friends, family, um, relatives, distraught, frustrated, angry, confused over why, you know, why? What did, what did we do wrong where a veteran commits suicide? So my focus is on getting the discussion of mental health front and center and as typical and as commonplace as uh, as it is now to say thank you for your service pre 9 11 people didn't really thank you for your service that was an anomaly post 9 11 you know now it's cool to be a be a veteran so my my mission statement is to um bring veteran suicide to light and to and to bring answers and solve the suicide crisis now, the the VA has said that, and in, in these numbers have been out for quite some time, and I, I don't know if they've been updated, but they like to use the, the number 22, right? 22 veterans a day are taking their lives. Now, you had said 50 vets. Do you, do you believe it's double of what the VA is saying? So my belief is that the number is probably closer to a hundred, maybe more per day. Right? Let me, Oh, Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, wow. and I, let me, let me walk through the data here, but let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you believe anything that comes out of the VA? Oh. Do you believe anything the government has to tell you? No. Then why on earth would any of us believe or accept 22 a day? Right. Right. Fair question. So it it's is. like being a vet and going to the VA. You don't believe anything they say. Right. Okay. And, and and that's sad because that's where we are now as a nation, you know, and, and, you know, it's, and it's, 
Yeah. It's maddening. Um, at the same time, yet you know, the government's not going to come save you. You know, it takes folks like you to stand up for the good of the country, get involved, and do what you can do to help save lives. And really, you just said something that really stood out to me. When somebody takes their life, you re- you you say, look, there's a 50 to 100 to 100 people that knew that veteran that are attached to that veteran, family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, um, co-workers, all those lives are now affected. Do you ever engage with some of those folks as well to try to walk them through the next steps of their recovery process after losing somebody that they have loved so dearly? I do. I do. And it, and it comes down to telling your story. Right. And, and like most veterans, the family members and the friends of veterans who commit suicide, they just want to be heard. So uh, my mission in part is to get people to tell their story. You know, it's, it's kind of like, it's hard to shoot somebody if you're friends with them. Right. It's hard to hurt somebody if you love them. Right. So if you're, somebody's telling their story, it's hard to kill yourself if somebody cares about your existence. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we face as veterans. We don't feel respected. We don't feel that our sacrifice is warranted. We don't feel that um, what we've, what we volunteered to do is being returned. You know, when you, when you make a commitment and you sign your line and whether you do it consciously or just kind of way in the back of your mind, you have this, yeah, I, I could die doing this crap, right? Serving our, our country. Well, when you come out and then, you know, nobody cares, right? Again, people say they care and your immediate friends and family care and the country for the most part cares. But when you turn to them and say, listen, I'm suicidal, watch what happens. The reaction is this, okay? It is the, it is the single most taboo subject sitting in our mouths right now so the word suicide is like the word abortion 60 50 70 years ago right or marriage out of wedlock 60 70 80 years ago it was as taboo as saying suicide today right now people tend to question this number of 22 or 50 or where, where, where are these numbers coming from well if you follow the va back in 2017, 2018, they got a directive from Congress to to go to war and and end this 22 a day. So what the VA did was they screwed around with the numbers and they came out and said, the number is down to 17 a day. Okay. Well, no, nobody believes them, not anybody in the community. Right. So taking that study and looking at Addie's magazine. Um, Christine Walker is the editor-in-chief, a fellow veteran. I was just on the phone with her. Um, and she's she publishes um, the uh, this study that's a combination of um, University of uh, Columbia in New York. And it's an eight-state study that shows in their numbers 2.4 times more suicides than the VA reported. Okay. But once this stuff started coming out, of course, the VA starts backing up and saying, well, you know, it wasn't the best study and so on. But study after study comes out and points to the fact that the number is somewhere between 40 and 50. Now, that number is again based on the VA's statistical average, if you will. But the reality is only about 30% at best of the veteran population are plugged into the VA system in any form at all. So the VA is only counting the 30% of the veterans that they have access to. Okay. What they don't include in this article in At Ease magazine um, really digs into it. It's called Operation Deep Dive, and it's an ongoing um, study and it's an ongoing process that's reporting that that we eventually will report from every single one of the 50 states. Okay, so 
when you look at that study and you compare it to the other things, saying 50 veterans a day is easy. Just use the VA's number. This this study here, 2.4 times that number, you're well into the into the 40s. Look at the fact that the VA only accesses maybe 30 percent of the veteran population and then take the last piece into into account. Unless you're and again, the VA wants to focus on on a certain party's position on gun control. OK, because in that 17 or 18 that the VA reported, they claim that 13 of all of the 17 per day, their number uh, commit suicide by gun. Well, the veterans I talk to, um, most of them talk about suicide and their plan has nothing to do with a gun. Insulin overdose, drug overdose, motorcycles, one car accidents, falling off a building, right? Okay. I mean, I can go on drowning. You tell me, you tell me how many of your friends have been lost that are not classified as a suicide. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you that I tried to drink myself to, to death and you know it didn't work. Right. I tried other things to death. Didn't work. Okay. Now that's where my belief and faith in the baby Jesus, he wasn't letting me go because he's got a mission for me. Right. And part of it's writing these books and getting this message out there. But when you step back and you look at the hard facts as, you know, and look at it through the eyes of us, we can look around and see how many of our friends, former shipmates, relatives that were in the military are, are dropping dead. And here's a statistic that's going to blindside you. Ready for this? 20% of the military population is female, right? Females are the third highest suicide rate amongst veterans, period. Period. I've got articles coming out that are going to kind of try to touch on that subject. And I've been talking with uh, quite a number of female veterans. And it comes down to this. Let's just let's just say you had a great life growing up and you decide to join the military. Last year, the DOD, under orders from Congress, was, was supposed to release an annual report of how many sexual trauma assault uh, reports have been filed within the Department of Defense. The last report showed 36,000 reported cases of, of, of sexual trauma of some sort, anything from harassment to outright rape, okay? Now that's 36,000 that's reported. The women that I talk to say, listen, just like the VA and their 30% their number of access to VA, the majority of women don't report what happens to them, again, whether it's harassment or whether it's outright brutal rape, they don't report it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So think about it. What would the real reports be? 138,000, a quarter million. So all of those women are going through trauma that in my opinion is 10 times harder than any of the trauma I've gone through or my fellow vets, male vets have gone through just by the nature of being a woman and the compassion of a woman and so on. Right. So they bury that trauma. And then just like the rest of us, it comes out. But for women, it's coming out, you know, in a fashion that's risen them to the third highest suicide rate amongst veterans. So if the number's 50, right, a day, think about how many female veterans, sisters, mothers, grandmothers are committing suicide because of trauma from the from their time in the military. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, I can uh, I can attest to um, you know the preferred method uh, for veterans that take their own lives is not pills. It is not a gun. Um, it is actually getting into a vehicle and taking it into a very very high rate of speed into a wall um, off a cliff whatever it may be, um, because that's their preferred method. I, I don't know why, why it's like that, but the VA will not count that as a suicide. They're going to count that as a wreck. Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, you're right. You know, they only count the suicides by, you know, the overdoses, you know, a weapon, you know, the no, even no, no, I got to correct you there, and I apologize yeah. for that. But the VA won't count overdose as a suicide, okay? Not unless oh, really? you leave a blatant note, 
Okay. Oh, they again. If you don't leave a blank, a, a, a note that says, "Listen, I just emptied my bottle of pain pills down my throat with a bottle of scotch." Okay. Right. If they don't see the note, they ain't counting you as a suicide. They're not. The VA. L- listen to this. The VA. Oh, was just so what would that be considered? Pills. An accidental that's death. That's correct. Huh. That's correct. If you look at this report in part by Columbia. Uh, university. Okay. It makes clear that the, um, the accidental deaths are not just not counted by, uh, in the veterans community. It's not counted inside a DOD because that's another whole battleground of the number of suicides prior to discharge, you know, active duty suicides. Why isn't our country being more transparent with us? Yeah. So let me say it like this. The last budget just gave the government, gave the VA $6.8 billion to quote unquote, solve the suicide problem. Okay. So um, when I was on with uh, Colonel Manis um, and his, his, um, his live show, uh, uh, we were, we were talking about that statistic and where all this money went. Okay. So the VA now has this, it's got a pretty nice commercial. OK, that says, you know, you know, start talking about your trauma. OK, but if it wasn't for Colonel Manis showing me that clip, I've never seen it. I've never seen it on TV. I've never seen it. I've never seen it anywhere. So where did this six point eight billion dollars go? OK, because veteran suicides are not slowing down. Listen, I'll be back on your show in a year or a month, whenever you invite me. OK, what I'm watching is I'm watching this chart go through the roof. OK, I my expectation and buckle up. My expectation is this number is going to hit 200, 300, 400 a day, a day, unless we we really change something, okay, like the administration and get somebody in there that the previous pre- president got us private care. When, when the private administration got us private care, my world changed. It changed. I started going to civilian doctors, and I started getting answers, and then I started getting healthy for the first time in four plus decades. Hmm. You know, it's sad because, you know, the military and and veteran population in the community is an at-risk and vulnerable population. Um, And when these folks take their own lives, it's Every single time that that happens, it takes all that patriotism from that person and it begins to remove all that patriotism from this country. One veteran is now this country is going to be less patriotic without that veteran. You start times in that by 22, 50, 100, 200, 300. Pretty soon, we're not going to have any patriotism in this country anymore because we're going to be gone. The people, the 1% that stand up and fight for this country, patriotic people, people that stand for the flag and love America and will lay down their lives in defense of this beautiful nation. When you start to completely eradicate those people, you you don't have a country left. And and to me, that's the that's the scary part. Like, we're we're not going to have a country If, if we don't step up now and begin to make changes that are going to protect veterans and, 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 and active duty military. No one's going to join anymore because they see what their sisters or brothers or moms and dads have gone through. They're like, yeah, I don't want to live that kind of life. You know, and then you start to see all these other things start to happen and you're and, and, and it starts to really raise that red flag to say, ah, no, why am I going to, why am I going to serve a nation that, that, was really treating us like crap. And it almost feels as if, as if it's an ungrateful nation, you know, and that's hard for me to even say, but that's where we're at. Like that's the climate of our country right now. And, you know, truth, truth hurts, you know, facts are facts and those are facts. And without folks like you stepping up and attacking the problem, None, none of this would be getting addressed because, like I said earlier, the government is not coming to save us. <laughs> They're just not. So, 
you had mentioned, you know, look, you have a purpose, you have a passion. Everything that you tried to do in the past didn't work. So you're here for a reason. God has you here on this planet for a reason. And that reason, as you have, have, have mentioned, is writing books and getting your message out there. Dave or Doug, can you explain exactly what your message is? Yeah, veterans, we need to tell our story. And all those who did not serve need to understand that 50 veterans a day are committing suicide. As I keep um, spreading this word, I'm, I, I do get inundated by civilians who are, are dumbfounded by by this number. And they'll say the same things you say. Oh, I, I heard it was 22. Or I heard it was 17. Well, um, what's what's the number for it to be a pandemic? Because in my book, A Date with Suicide, the opening, the forward to the book walks through an article I published that's called A Busload of Veterans, right? So if if right now, if, if while you and I are talking, a busload of um, seniors goes off the road heading to the casino from, say, New York to Atlantic City, and all 50 on that bus die. You know what's going to happen, right? It's going to be front page news for a day or two. And, you know, the, the Congress is going to step up and say, we, we want to know what happens. Well, what if it happens again the next day, right? Two days in a row, 50 people on a bus full of seniors going to Atlantic City get killed. That's 100, right? Oh, you know damn well they're going to have emergency hearings in Congress. People are going to be standing up. The media is going to be blaming the tire companies and the metal makers and the, you name it, right? Look at the look at Delta Airlines, right? Look at the attention that thing's getting, and nobody's died, okay? But if it's a busload of civilians getting killed, oh, the whole world's going to pay attention. Well, guess what? A busload of veterans is committing suicide every damn day. They did it yesterday. They're doing it today. And they'll do it tomorrow. And where's everybody standing up to get on this thing? They're not. Right? Okay. So look at it in that sense. And then ask ourselves, why? Well, it goes to that sacred word, that taboo word, suicide. You say suicide and everybody turns green. Well, my mission is to get people to look each other in the eye and say, okay, I'm not going to back up anymore. Suicide. Yeah. All right, this sucks. Let's get answers, period. Full stop. Your book, A Date with Suicide. Can you give us an elevator pitch on what folks may expect when they pick that book up and read it? Yeah, the title is a lot heavier than the read, okay? What this book is filled with is true stories of myself. I, I literally open up the story by saying, how, how do I tell this story? How do I get into walking you through what's going on without exposing my most deepest secrets and my most intimate thoughts, right? Well, you can't. I have to expose myself in order to get my fellow vets to do the same. I have to tell what I survived, right? I didn't just write the book. I, I survived the life, okay? I sat there so many times with the opportunity and the means to commit suicide. But, at the, but in the end, there was always that voice that kept saying to me, nah, I got something I need you to do. So put the damn thing down and let's, let's, let's keep moving forward. Okay. So a quick insight to that book, I'm, I'm giving you four things and I'm asking two questions. First and foremost, what's a veteran? How come so many of us do not feel like veterans, Right. When I talk to people who are on the suicidal path or who are trying to get off that cart that's taking them to a date with suicide, they all tell me the same things. It starts with, I don't feel like a veteran. I don't feel the pride. Well, the answer is why? Well, I get into it and I answer the questions of why. Because as I've looked back and started writing these books, it came to two questions. What happened to me and why? Right? Okay. Okay. First and foremost, we go after the, what is a veteran? Why do we not feel like veterans? And how do we solve that problem? The next is trauma. Listen, here's the crazy thing. When I went through boot camp, I read a great story in here about going through boot camp when a guy tried to kill himself, okay? Here's a kid, you know, we're all kids then, right? Slicing his wrist, trying to get out of, trying to kill himself, but was he? I was more pissed off at him that I had to deal with it than 
than I was about him committing suicide. Okay. So talking about our trauma and understanding that a trauma for me is a world different than a trauma for you and respecting everybody's position on trauma. Okay. We can't judge other people's trauma, but we have to learn to talk about it and then respect their position. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what is a veteran? What, you know, talking about your trauma, telling your story, all right, especially with the VA. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the VA is not just PTSD, but it is suicide. Okay. I never once thought about suicide until after my first meeting at VA. Okay. And that's a key part of this story. And then at the, at the last, in the last chapter, we get into the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual whys. Why is it that I'm angry? And how does that anger affect me? Well, think about it. You know, we're all military here, right? What happens when you get that adrenaline flowing? You don't feel pain. You don't feel fear. You don't feel emotion. You don't feel anything except that warrior that was bred into you, right? Okay. What about love? What happens when, you know, a, a, a love interest breaks up with you? Your head hurts. Your heart hurts. Your emotions hurt. Your physical body, you can't eat. So if we have two opposite ends of the spectrum, what happens to you when you have a love interest that fails? And what happens to you when you go through trauma? All of these things affect the four corners of your sacred being, your physical, your mental, your spiritual, and your emotional bodies. And every veteran to a man and to a woman, a woman say the same thing. I'm hurting. Okay. Now you fill in the blank, which hurts more? Your physical, your mental, your spiritual anxiety is real. Okay. It hurts. It's physically debilitating. So if just anxiety does that, what does it do to the rest of your body? How does it affect your blood flow? How does it affect your breathing? We all know this by looking at our fellow vets. When your breathing is super shallow, you're suffering, right? If you get hurt physically, whether it's shot in combat or whether you're on the flight line taking dead bodies from the flag-driven coffins out, okay, and one of those coffins rolls over your foot, you're in physical pain, but you're in so much emotional pain because you're dealing with these things every single day. We lose ourselves. And part of what I'm doing here is getting people to understand, A, I'm just like you. I'm suffering all the pain you're suffering. Mm -hmm. B, your suffering is no better or worse than mine, okay? It's only a matter of how much you feel it is, and I respect that. And then saying to them, listen, we can, we can unwind this insanity that we got wound into, but it starts with identifying, am I a veteran or not? And then coming to terms with it, and then walking down the path. What trauma? What happened to me and why? And when you start looking at those questions, each one of us individually, because we're all different. Once you start absorbing that and then you realize this, this is going to blow your mind. I'm not a kumbaya guy. I'm not a sit down and do the ohms and meditate. Right. But I, I, I no longer I didn't want to drink anymore. I was sick of it. I, I didn't want to. I said no more with the VA drugs. I can't do this anymore. And in my ear, I kept hearing that same stupid thing. Well, then learn to meditate. I'm like, I ain't freaking meditating, man. I'm not a meditating guy. And then one day I'm sitting there with the anxiety broiling inside of me. And I said, I can't do this. I put my head back and I said, okay, what do they say? Breathe in your nose and out your mouth. So I started focusing on breathing in through my mouth. All of a sudden, it felt like I was getting oxygen to my body. And then that short, shallow pump, pump, pump started becoming drawn out. And I could feel my chest hurt because I was expanding it in a, in a way I, I wasn't used to. But I was breathing in and focusing on exhaling. Okay. No kumbaya, just simple breathing. Five minutes went by. And as God is my witness, for a moment, my anxiety disappeared. Three seconds, four seconds five seconds. And then it came back like I got hit with a sledgehammer. Bam! But it was gone for five seconds. And I said, son of a bitch, this actually works. Well, let me not get ahead of myself. 
It only worked for a few seconds. So I did it again the next day and then the next day. And then I slowly built on that. And over a period of time, I breathed in and out until I learned to get rid of my anxiety. Again, a little more complicated than that. I would start saying release, 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 and doing a lot of things that would help my physical, my emotional, my spiritual, and my mental bodies take a break from everything I was dealing with just long enough to quiet my mind, relax my body, and let my emotions unwind. Hence, I learned something. I used to remember my second beer. That second beer is the one I was racing to get through. Because when that second beer would kick in, that horrific ball of nastiness that ground away just below my sternum and just above my belly button, that anxiety central, that second beer would take that away. Mm. Now I knew why I drank. Now I said, oh, starting to put some pieces together here. So for me, those were the stepping stones. And it took years. And then when I finally realized, listen, I, I've got to, I've got to tell this story, right? I've got to tell my story or I'm never going to continue to heal, right? Mm. And then I hear the whispers, you need to write the book. And I was like, that ain't happening. Who the hell is going to read this crap, right? You know? And I sat down and I wrote my first book, 2,442 Steps to Crazy. Um, yeah, the crazy, the beginning. Book two of this one's coming out soon, all right? Because I knew that for me, it wasn't the it wasn't the military all by itself that caused me to be as messed up as I am. Okay, I had to take it back to my childhood and say, "All right, so when you read my book, 2,442 Steps to Crazy, like so many others who enlisted at the age of 17, like I did, right? Came from a broken home, came from a tough upbringing, right? Limited options, so on and so on." Well, I didn't realize that all that baggage I carried into the military was going to kind of follow me through life. I just assumed it was over, right? But when I sat down and started writing it out, I realized how much crap I had stuffed into my sea bag, that sea bag that rests inside of me. What do you guys call it in the Army? Duffel bag, right? You know, so I don't know what the heck they call it now, but it's a sea, it was a sea bag back then. I never realized how much crap I stuffed in there. And each thing was like, uh, what was that? Olive Garden Bloom Onion, right? As I was letting each one loose, it was like there was a million tentacles stuck to that, but it, it no longer stuck to me. Once I started accepting my trauma and saying, yeah, I need, I need to let this crap go. And the way I learned to do that was telling my story. Sure. People reach out, veterans and non-veterans. It is the most important thing I can say to them. Listen, I'm stealing Dr. Fraser Crane's words. I'm listening. Hmm. Folks, we're being joined by author D. Paul Fleming, a U.S. Navy veteran and also the author of A Date with Suicide. Folks, he lived the book. Uh, he made himself vulnerable uh, to reach the populace of uh, veterans out there uh, that are going through some life struggles and some life challenges. Uh, you are not alone. And when you pick up his book, you will soon realize that there's a lot of people out there that feel exactly the way you do. And there is hope out there. Um, now, Doug, I want you to, to finish with, some sort of encouragement. What sort of words or what sort of inspiration or encouragement could you share with us today to perhaps somebody that is tuning in right now and watching this that is going through some tough times, some hardships in life, and they're not feeling well and they want to end it all. I want you to talk directly to them right now. I lived it. I lived what you're dealing with. I get it. And so do far too many of us. We are just like you. But here's what I'm trying to say to you. You can win this war with yourself. There is so much more coming for you in life. 
that if you survive this challenge, you're going to be able to take all the things that you have in life. I don't care if you're 22 or 72. All the things that you have in life, put them in a nutshell and move them forward. This is by far the toughest obstacle you'll ever overcome. But once you do, you will know that like me, nothing can beat me. Nothing. Mm. Only I can beat myself. And I know that I'm not going to beat myself. I might beat myself up from time to time, just like you. Okay. But if you need someone to tell their, to, to, um, to hear your story, reach out to me, reach out to a battle buddy, reach out to the, uh, the, the uh, 988, right? The suicide hotline, reach out to somebody. Most importantly, look at your wife, your husband, look at your parent, an aunt, an uncle, somebody look at them and say, I need help. Full stop. I need help. Okay. Say those three words out loud and find somebody to help you. All right. And again, if you can't reach out to me, I'm helping, I'm helping vets every day with either getting them plugged into um, a service organization or the VA or helping them talk through their uh, potential disability, finding mental health providers. I'm getting more and more uh, requests from vets to connect them with mental health providers. And, you know, that's a piece of something I've been putting together. So keep the faith, keep moving forward. And remember, it's tough living. It's easy dying. But remember those who you leave behind, including me, right? We continue to suffer and we suffer more when you allow a date with suicide to show up on your calendar. Hmm. That's very deep. Doug, how can people reach out to you? So you can find me on um, Facebook at D. Paul Fleming. I'm on Twitter. Uh, Veterans Wellness is my handle there. If you, um, you know, if you don't want all the hoopla, you can find me on Twitter at uh, D. Paul Fleming. Um, you can go to my website, dpaulfleming.com. Um, you can find my books on Amazon, right? Um, uh, this this book, A Date with Suicide, there's 40 more topics that I'm going after four at a time, okay? Right now, uh, anger is the number one leading uh, request from fellow vets who have read the book that want the next book to be, you know, more focused on certain things like anger, and I'm, I'm working on that. But if you're looking to reach out to me, um, you can hit me up on my email at dpaul at blackhawkbooks.com. Right. Or hit me up on the social medias. I got a um, I got an Instagram and a TikTok out there somewhere, but I'm not quite sure how they work. Oh, I'll give you one more. On June 29th, I'm in Rolla, Missouri for a uh, veterans um, band uh, concert. OK, I was invited out there by some uh, by some other vets and I'm um, going to going to Missouri to have some have some fun. I hope. It. it is it like a veteran concert or? Yeah. Yeah. It's veteran bands and veteran, veteran music festival. Um, the gentleman I just, a vet I just connected with um, is running the events and he's been doing it for a couple of years and um, chamber of commerce tells him there's going to be 4,000 people there. And wow. again, they're still selling tickets. So um, if you look at my uh, Facebook, you can, you can find the link to it, but it's June 29th, Rolla, Missouri, um, hero stock. Oh uh, yeah. I know those. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Jason Steiner. There you go. There you go. Jason's the guy putting that on, and yeah, he invited me out, and I'm helping. Yeah, it was like, thing. yeah, you said mute because I've had a lot of you know musicians on this show, a lot of singer songwriters, and you said music, and I thought they were out of Nebraska uh, for some reason, but yep. uh, so Missouri. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're, uh, they're in, you've got six or so shows coming up in Nebraska. Again, I'm 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 kind of new to this. I just connected with them uh, oh. not too long ago. All right. right. But, um, you know, so and I got to kind of throw this out there. Listen, the, the last concert I went to was Madonna in the uh, early 80s. So um, going to a concert's a, a new a new a, a new old adventure for me. Right. So I got to mm -hmm. apologize for missing some of the key lingo, if you will. But, yeah, Hero Stock is uh, inviting me out there and I'm, you know, banging on some doors and uh, getting some folks to come along. Well, that's very nice for for Jason Steiner to invite you out there for uh, for that. I'm sure it's going to be a, an, an amazing trip. I know they have a lot of great singer songwriters that go out there and participate 
um, in these types of events. But listen, uh, D. Paul Fleming, uh, I'd like to thank you for for joining us today. Uh, you know, I, I I know you added a lot of value out there to a lot of veterans out there that may be needing it the most, and 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 really at the end of the day, everybody. It's this isn't just for veterans, folks. This is for people. We're we're all human beings. We all go through trauma. We all go through suffering. Uh, and it's how you unpack it and how you, you know, kind of deal, deal with it, you know, that will definitely, um, you know, uh, you know, bring you to the, you know, to the person you, you will become. So there, there is hope out there. There is hope out there. So, um, folks, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the program. It has never been easier to listen to this podcast. We're on Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, TikTok. And X, simply search today with Tally. Also, learn more about me and my personal story, and perhaps even get my new book at BrianTally.com. BrianTally.com. I didn't choose this job, it chose me. Folks, remember to stay inspired, stay encouraged, stay motivated, and always stay in the fight. Until next time for the Today with Tally podcast, this is Brian Tally. Good night, super fine. God bless. This is the Today with Tally Podcast.